What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 394. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and uh, I'm in Las Vegas, but joining me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, hi. How are you? I miss you. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I haven't seen uh, you in a few days. That is true. <laughs> uh, we, we, we got to spend a, a cool 11 minutes in the booth together as we covered the finals of Grand Prix Las Vegas. The yeah, <laughs> it went by quickly, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but everything's cool at home. Are you uh, you looking forward to this weekend? Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to uh, playing in Cleveland. This is the first tournament I've played at since Owen knocked me out of uh, the top four of PT Eldritch Moon. So I have nowhere to go but down. What? Well, that doesn't make sense. You haven't even been playing. You're going to come back with a reckless abandon. I'm going to go to Cleveland as well this weekend. A team limited GP should be a fun one to check out. Uh, so we've got a lot of stuff to talk about on the show this week. Before we get into anything, though, I want to mention our sponsor channel, Fireball.com. Please make sure you do check them out for anything that you need this magic related, including awesome free content. I mean, look, we give you a good reason to go there just straight off the bat because you're going to find great free content by some of the best players and content creators in the world. Luis, you did an Amonkhet and a Mirrodin draft this week on there. And there was an interesting article by Brian DeMars about uh, what makes a limited format great. And he used Amonkhet as the example. So those are just a few of the cool things that you I, can I actually find. had a piece of content that I think will be very appealing to uh, LR listeners. Because oh. it, it's a it was a video set with a constructed deck that's about as close as you can get to drafting, uh, as I can think of. Uh, I was playing Manaless Dredge in Legacy. And... That's a deck that has no lands in it and doesn't cast any spells, and you always choose to be on the draw. What, what does this have to do with limited? It's just magic at its purest. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, okay. So some of the things that he said is true, like, for example, that that exists. <laughs> the other stuff, uh, if you want to walk on the wild side, you can check that. Manila Stretch uh, is a video. Yes, it's a, it's a legacy video. All right, legacy video. <laughs> <It's, laughs> wow. Right up our listener's alley, Luis. Well oh, done. It's got... And it's got the nice title of this graveyard deck uh, function. Fun this graveyard combo deck functions with zero lands. God. So no, no, Click no bait. clickbait at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But make sure, please, that you do check out channelfireball.com. Of course, you can pick up any single sealed product, anything that you need. You're going to find it at CFB. Also, the show is brought to you by you via the Patreon. We really appreciate all the support that we get for limited resources. Uh, it's easy to do. You can go to patreon.com slash limited resources. All the information is there. Now, before we get into our main topic, I got to bring in our special guest host. That's right. Coming out of nowhere, it's Ben Stark. Ben, he's hey. sitting right next to me, by the way. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Welcome back to limited resources. It's always great to have you on. You're a fan favorite and, and Luis and I love you too. And uh, we thought we'd bring you in because what ended up happening, Ben, last week is we did a show, uh, a Q&A style show, where the uh, patrons got to ask us questions about leveling up. And as it turns out, we had a big outpouring of questions uh, for that. Too many to answer, in fact, in one show. And I thought, God, we got to do something. These are really good questions. And it turns out you're one of the people that I go to for level up advice. And you happen to be here in Vegas with me. And I thought, let's just bring Ben on the show. So that's what we're going to be doing on this episode. Are you stoked? Yeah. I mean, unlike Luis, I was smart enough to stay in Vegas for the week after the Grand Prix. <laughs> and I love answering questions. So bring it on. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to skip the Patreon question of the week. And normally we get we answer one question from Patreon. But we're going to be answering so many this week that I really wanted to, to dial in on that. We're also going to skip the crack pack this week for similar reasons. Because the Q&A is not the only thing we're talking about. There's also two pieces of news and information that we want to get to you. So let's get into those and then we'll start answering the level up questions. The first one, guys, where Louis, somehow we, or we recorded the show early and then of course the big news broke like the next day. But there's a new block structure uh, coming for Magic. Uh, it was a big, big change. Uh, Mark Rosewater wrote a, an article explaining what was happening and why they were doing it. But for the purposes for us, there's a summary here. The summary is is that blocks as they existed before are no longer. Every set is a standalone set and will be drafted as a standalone set. And every set is now a big set. There aren't small sets anymore. Uh, and then core set is going to be coming back in some form. We haven't really got detail yet on what that's going to look like. But 
that's obviously a huge change, you know, since I've been drafting, it's actually gotten smaller and smaller. When I first came back, it was typical to have big set, small set, small set, and you draft all three of them by the end of it. And then it kind of went to a, a, a big set, small set, and now it's just all big sets. So Luis, you're the resident game designer of us three here. Uh, what do you think this means for us limited players? I think it's good news. Uh, I generally have enjoyed triple large set. If you look at a lot of the throwback draft formats that I think are the best, it's like triple Mirrodin, you know, triple mm-hmm. champions, etc. So I think it's a great change. It's also easier to make a cohesive draft format with three of the same set than it is to introduce a new set because every set wants some slightly different things and that doesn't always line up for for drafting purposes. So I actually think it's great news. Uh, I would rather, and plus I'd rather just get a new format when the format changes. So I'm pretty happy with how this is going to work out. I, I predict it's going to be good for those who play limited. Okay, cool. And Ben, do you agree with Luis there? Like when you look back at your favorite sets, are they typically triple big set or do you like the ones that kind of mix it up with the small sets in there too? I completely agree with Luis. Uh, he actually named some of my favorite sets. Uh, tri- <laughs> triple Champions, my favorite of all time. Triple Mirrodin was quite good also. Triple Time Spiral. I think uh, having a whole all new cards every three months to play with Unlimited is really exciting. Like, it was kind of cool to see how the card values changed a little, but now you just have a whole new set to explore, a whole new draft format every three months. So, I mean, I think that's better. Uh, small sets were, you know, they're fine, but they're less to explore. They're less to learn. They're less uh, cards to interact with each other. You know, so I'm really excited about, you know, every three months, a brand new draft format, a big set, a lot of cards, learn the format, play the format for three months, move to the next format. Yeah, I, 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 I had a hard time conceptualizing exactly how this would go. So I just thought to myself, well, what are my favorite sets? And looking back, or one of my favorite formats to draft, and they're always big set, and including ones that have a small set with them, and I just prefer drafting it without it without exception. So I'm definitely excited about this. I think this is just very good news for us limited players. It's a big change. It, it really is. I mean, you know, we usually have to spend quite a bit of time talking about how the new set integrates with what we had from the old set. But honestly, since they've put the new sets drafted first in its two packs, the the older of the two sets, it, it felt a little bit like an afterthought at some point when you were drafting it, where any of the core concepts, they couldn't really hammer home without fully carrying them over into the next set. And anything that you needed critical mass for, just you couldn't get if it was from that set. So it feels like, I, I'm assuming that's kind of what you were referring to, Luis, when you said it's hard to, to merge those things sometimes. Yeah, you end up in a spot where you either have to like oversaturate the small set with with the, the cards that push the theme, but or you what realistically happens is each set has new themes, the slightly different things, right? Every time we have a new set, there's new mechanics, even if they're like sometimes takes on old ones, and that mm-hmm. waters down what whatever was present in the first set. So you like one example is you you look back at a uh, Kaladesh, and like energy became much worse when Ether Revolt showed up. So. You had this like interesting mechanic, energy, that all of a sudden became kind of a, a you know an, an afterthought once you had a set where there weren't as many good ways to spend it. Yeah, but and and if wizards had wanted to make energy still relevant in a big theme, they would have to fully carry that over. But then it doesn't feel like a new set, right? Because it feels like more of the same thing that you've already been doing. Yeah, you would end up yeah in a spot where in order to have the new themes play out. You crowd out some of the old themes, and right. I, I think you just skipping skipping all of it and just having uh, a big set is awesome. Okay, so that looks like an overall positive change, though. You know, there it, could can you imagine any any downside to this, either of you? Uh, I mean, we're all just well, big fans of it. Is there anything that we could be giving up here? I mean, if you end up in a spot where you don't like the set, that that's not great, but then at least you rotate out the whole set at once. So mm-hmm. I think that is I think that's pretty good, and. Really, I can't think of a triple small set, uh, or sorry, triple big set that really went too wrong. Triple small sets go wrong all the time. That's why we don't generally draft, you know, this triple cold snap was atrocious. <laughs> uh, but cold snap also had like some really bad themes. But, uh, right. you know, like collect as many surging cards as you want. Just have yeah. 10 two ones and play on turn three. <laughs> <laughs> discard, discard your hand on turn two and limited. Like. <laughs> yeah. So... But I, I don't know. I mean, maybe Ben can think of one, but I can't think of a big set that had a theme that was just like very unpleasant to draft. Like every big set is at least good. 
No, I can't think of that. And I think the positives way outweigh the negatives. But I briefly touched on the only negative. I thought it was pretty cool seeing how the card, the same card's value, like an individual card, how its value changed. Because you have like the cards from Kaladesh, and then Revolt would get released. And then the Kaladesh cards are now interacting with all these Revolt cards. So some of them get better, some of them get worse. So that's the only thing I'm probably going to miss from going from uh, two set blocks to, you know, just drafting three of one set. But I strongly agree with Luis here. I think, you know, often uh, th three of the same pack big set has been the best draft format over and over and over and over again. I think the formats have gotten consistently worse when they added in the second sets. And I think it's really, really, really exciting that we're just going to have a whole new limited format every three months, all new cards. Yeah. Like, to me, that's wonderful. Okay. So that's something to look forward to, I think, for most of us. If you have uh, any opinions on that, feel free to, to tweet it. Uh, tweet them at us. It's an interesting discussion point, but I, at least for us three, it seems like a, a universal positive. All right. So the next uh, piece of information that we want, we need to hit here before we get into the questions is we need to touch on the rules and mechanics from uh, Hour of Devastation because uh, next week is the, the sunset show and uh, we're going to want to talk about uh, the cards and stuff for that. So I'm going to go over those here. They're actually really straightforward if you played uh, any amount of Amonkhet because a lot of them are uh, different versions of things that we saw in Amonkhet. So the first one is called Eternalize, and it's the same as Embalm. So you get to pay uh, some amount of mana to have the creature come back into play as a token that's a copy of itself. But the difference is, is that the tokens come back as a 4-4 version of themselves rather than whatever their power and toughness was before. But they still have the same abilities and things like that. And then also they end up being a black zombie rather than a white one, which, which probably isn't super relevant, but it might be. But those are the only differences. So we get an embalm where the creature is now an improved, better version of itself coming back rather than one where it's just an exact copy of itself. So pretty straightforward. Uh, I mean, they're always four fours, right? Like there's yes. no there's no variation, and every creature with Eternalize, as far as I know, starts smaller than four four. That's right. Yeah. So they all get bigger and badder and better, and then otherwise it's just our our job to to add this new factor in when we're evaluating these cards because we know about how Embalm work now that we've played with it for a while, and Eternalize is just a twist on that. Uh, the next one is Afflict, and uh, Afflict comes with a number, so it'll say like Afflict one or Afflict two. And it says whenever a creature with afflict becomes blocked, the defending player loses that much life. So if you have a creature with afflict two and you attack and your opponent says blocked, a trigger will go on the stack and they're going to, and the opponent is going to lose two life. If it's afflict one, it would be one life. This happens uh, when blocks happen, regardless of if the creature dies or leaves play or anything. And uh, it is life loss, not damage, in case that becomes relevant for any of the cards in the set. Ben, when you and I chatted about this earlier, you said, oh, great, another aggressive mechanic. <laughs> w w what's your take on Afflict? Well, I mean, it's not a big deal, but I generally find games to be more fun. Uh, the longer they go, the more decisions you have, the more turns where there's double blocks in combat. Exert is a very aggressive mechanic. It makes it really hard for people to block. It specifically makes low-power, high-toughness creatures really ineffective. Afflict kind of does the same thing. If I put out a creature with Afflict, and then you put out a 1-4 to try and block it, you're still taking the Afflict damage turn after turn. Mm -hmm. So it's another aggressive mechanic. It's another mechanic that makes blocking hard. And you're kind of not in favor of that, right? I mean, I mean, not that you're saying it's the devil, but you right. prefer it a little a, slower. A little of that, no big deal, but ultimately... Uh, I prefer longer games, double blocks, more decisions. Luis, what do you think about it? I mean, we've had a lot of talks on the podcast about uh, about uh, Exert, and Exert has largely colored how this format actually has played out, right? It, it's really kind of been a defining, like probably, like I thought Embalm was going to be the defining uh, mechanic for Amonkhet upon seeing the set review or the uh, the card file at first, and now it's definitely exert. Like that's changed the way everything's played out. Do you think Afflict has that type of potential as well? It, it certainly has the potential. Uh, it is naturally an aggressive mechanic. It makes you lose life for blocking. It punishes you for blocking. But it, you know, what what kind of cards get put on it or get or get it put on are really kind of plays into how aggressive it is because mm -hmm. you know as we're going to get to we're going to see exert on like tap abilities here exert is yeah. not a mechanic that has to be insanely aggressive it just the exert cards are insanely aggressive so i see maybe if maybe a flick ends up like that though i doubt it i, I think it's just going to be an aggressive mechanic right. okay right and to be fair 
Exert didn't have to shape the format as much as it did. Uh, Gust Walker and Hooded Brawler are just too good. You know what I mean? Like, those right. could be aggressive exert creatures, and they could be substantially worse, mm -hmm. and they would still be good limited commons and way less shaping of the format. Okay. Well, why don't we talk about exert, since you mentioned it, Luis. Exert, like you said, is the same as before, except for that some of the creatures can exert without attacking by using other tap abilities to get a bonus. For example, there's a card called Oasis Ritualist, which is a 2-4 for 3 and a green that taps for any color of mana. But you can exert it when you tap it and get two of any color instead. So it's kind of a cool twist on exert where it's, it's taking it, like you said, Luis, away from uh, being so uh, combat centric and a little bit more towards, hey, do you want to use this for a short term gain but have a long term loss of you know losing a blocker and losing its ability for a turn? And that's cool, right? I mean, it's something that we're comfortable with, but it's a new take on it. Yeah, like you, you, if we see something like tap, exert, draw a card, like that'd be sweet. But I, I we're probably going to see yeah. you know, exert plus, plus plus three plus seven first strike or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll keep an eye out for that too. Uh, the next one is, uh, and this is the last one that's new. Uh, Deserts matter. So there's a deserts matter sub theme. There's a, a subset of cards that care about if you control a desert or if you have a desert in your graveyard. And you'll get a bonus if you if you meet that requirement. So uh, some of the deserts that we've seen spoiled have cycling, and so. You know, they, they put that graveyard clause in so that you wouldn't be shy about cycling them if you needed to, and you'll get the bonus either way. Um, and it's neat. It's, it's just a, a clean, nice design. There's some um, special lands in the set that are deserts, and if you control one or it's in your yard, your creature gets bigger or your spell is better or whatever. It's actually pretty straightforward and, and, a, and a pretty cool little mechanic depending on how the deserts play out and how playable they are. I like it. I like stuff like that where um, it's like more resources to use and manage. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like the more that's going on in a game of Magic, the more choices, the more resource management, the more fun in my opinion. Yeah. You know, one yeah, of the, uh, go ahead, Luis. As long as the, the desert abilities don't break the color pie I'm in. <laughs> don't, don't, don't you dare start. You know what he's trying to do, Ben. Don't let him do it. So uh, one of the neat things too, there's little things like uh, since some of the deserts have cycling, you can actually have it in your hand. You know, maybe attack with the creature, get into combat, and then cycle it away so that the creature changes to the better version after having it in. You know, that little instant speed, stuff like that trick. So we'll, we'll be keeping our eye out for stuff like that. Now, the last two I'm going to touch on very quickly because they're basically the same as before. But Aftermath is back again. Uh, so it's the same as before. You can only cast the Aftermath from your graveyard. And uh, we're going to be seeing those cards. And then Cycling also has been carried over from Amonkhet here. And, and of course, it's the same as before as well. So... Very cool. Uh, lots to look forward to there. Uh, looks like a pretty easy transition, I think. Like if you're a newer player, you know, Eternalize is, is similar to the cards that you've been playing with, just a little bit different. Uh, the Deserts Matter is pretty straightforward. Exert is the same, just on a few different cards, and you're still going to see Aftermath and Cycling. Uh, Afflict is the only new thing, and it, it's a pretty straightforward mechanic as well. So I, I don't think that this is going to be a really heavy lift as far as understanding the rules and stuff. It's just a matter of, you know, getting the evaluations right and understanding what's going on in the format. Okay. Yeah, it's like a, a small set that doesn't add all that much because it's trying to support the themes of the big set. <laughs> you know, you're just on fire tonight. Aren't yeah, you? <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get into the uh, to the level up Q and A because this is the real meat of this particular episode of LR. And uh, you know, it's it's a special one. We've got Ben here as well, and uh, and and I want to hear, of course, your thoughts as well, Luis. And let's get into it right now. This one comes from Jeff, who says, "Hi, I have a couple of questions. If that's okay." All right. Uh, in a paper draft, which is how he plays, uh, how do you remember what you've drafted in the detail, like how many three drops you have? He says, I find this hard, especially since there are some colors I might not end up using and uh, sometimes end up with too few four drops or two drops or something like that. So why don't we start with that one? Ben, you know, you draft a lot on Magic Online, but when you're at the Pro Tour and at Grand Prix, you don't have that luxury. How, how do you remember kind of what's going on with your deck? Well, I'm not sure the viewers are going to like this answer, but the truth is I just memorized all the cards I draft. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like, it's important to, like, you know, it's not that many different pieces of information. So if you put in an effort to purposefully memorize them, I think you can get most of it. Like, you know, just when you take a card, say the card's name, think the card, think something about the card, think something about the card's name. You know how, like, memory and association work and stuff. Yeah. So if you just take a Hooded Brawler and don't think about it because it's the best card in the pack, three picks later you might not remember you take Hooded Brawler, right? But if you think when you take the Hooded Brawler, I got a Hooded Brawler, this a broken exert creature that's way too good, then you're way more likely to remember it, you know? So I, I just really just try and remember and there's not, like, any secret tri trick, well, and I'm pretty good at that. So. Luis, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Do you just do the same? Uh, yeah, well, it's two-pronged. 
One is what Ben said. We just played so much Magic, like we just remember all of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the shortcut, though, uh, that might actually help Jeff more more practically is you don't actually need to remember how many like four drops you have. You just need to remember how many two drops you have. Like no, no deck ever really got killed because they were short on five drops. Trust me, I, I've tested this theory. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a danger. You don't have to worry about it. Just make sure you have enough two drops and it kind of flows from there. You're, you're rarely going to be like you, you also can't really get two drop flooded. Like if you have too many two drops, that just means you're a beatdown deck. So, you know, just as long as you or keep track of like how many two drops you have and like what colors you have, then you should be good. You don't need to know everything about your deck. Yeah, I, I think that there's probably a few key things that you'll want to know. Two drops is definitely one of them. How your curve looks overall. One thing that I've seen players that are new to drafting when they can't see it is what colors, like how many cards of each color you're in. Because sometimes I've seen people you know, first pick a black card and then take a few blue cards and a few red cards, but they really want to play that black card. And so in their mind, they're just plain black. And then when they lay out their cards, they've just got not enough black cards. And they're like, oh, I guess I'm blue red. I didn't even know this whole time that I'm actually blue red, which is a weird thing to have happen, but I've seen it happen before. That may be how Gruel Obsidic got drafted. <laughs> we, we can't be sure. <laughs> so, you know, make sure that you are really trying to keep a fresh, clean slate on that at all times and not locking your brain in because when it's right in front of you it's easy to see that like because you know when it comes to changing colors i often you do a, a calculation where you say would i rather have an archfiend of ifnir and this uh you know three two menace or whatever right like a minotaur or would i rather have like these like you know a lay claim and a hieroglyphic illumination and you know maybe a, a good another good blue card and like a medium blue card and you're looking at those and you're saying you know I'm going to have to choose between these. But when you can't see that in front of you, it's much harder to make that evaluation if you're not actively remembering the cards or thinking of it. So try to make sure that you keep that in your head when you're drafting that like, yes, I first picked Archfiend of Ifnir and I'd prefer to be black, but I might not be, right? That That, that is a key thing that pops up pretty often. Um, Jeff has a follow-up question. He says, also, how do you assimilate all the info when a new set is out? In particular, which card goes into which archetype? Uh, for, and, and then he even brings up the nature of the small sets, uh, you know, when you already know a lot about the big sets, which, you know, obviously we're not going to have to deal with anymore. But I, I think that, Jeff, you, you know, you need to make sure that you kind of pace yourself, right? Nobody looks at the spoiler when the set first comes out and just has a complete understanding of how all these cards interact with each other, either whether they're coming into a, an environment that already exists or whether it's a brand new one. Uh, you know, you start to make assumptions, you start to look at uh, patterns that you see from set to set. But, you know, like even Ben Stark sitting next to me doesn't just have it all figured out on day one. He starts to assimilate it small pieces at a time and uses uh, information as he gets it. Oh, yeah. This one I could give good advice on. Nobody, including me, has it all figured out day one or day four or day seven. The key that, that I think has helped me, uh, especially even compared to a lot of pros, is staying open-minded. I think what people do way too much of is referencing the past for how a card was. Because let's say you had a given card in a different set with all other different cards, right? Like, it, there were no other card that was in both sets. Mm -hmm. That card's value can be very different now than it was back then. So what I try and do when I start playing a new format is just play that format. I, do, I try and discard like my previous knowledge of the cards and, and just kind of like absorb what's working, how the cards are performing. Maybe in the last format, white black was really controlling. Maybe in this format, it's really aggressive. I don't want to go into the format biased thinking of white black as a control deck. I want to draft white and black and see how see what works and what doesn't and how it plays out. If you keep an open mind and you let your opinions get shaped by what's actually happening in this format, you'll figure a lot out. What do you think about that, Luis? I think that it is hard to do what Ben says, but that is how you should do it. You, okay. you, it is hard to discard uh, a lot of your preconceived notions and just try to like learn things that new, like look at, you know, there, I, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but there's tons of cards that change in value dramatically once a new set comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, funny thing about this is it's not actually going to be applicable anytime soon because no. <laughs> after the set. Uh, no, well, but, 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 but with, still, they're all the, new cards at some point, right? Yes, it is easier – it is in some ways easier to dive into a new format than to like be tricked by uh, what happened in the old format. Like let's say – and I don't know if this is true or not. Let's say Hour of Devastation slows down the format and like Hooded Brawler becomes like worse than Naga Vitalist. People will be making that pick wrong for a long time because it was much better in, in you know, mm -hmm. Amon Cut. Yeah, and for, for the record, I didn't really mean just uh, when like 
the second set comes out and, you know, the change in card values. I meant like, for example, take a fairly generic type of fact like Electrify. Four mana deal four damage instant. There are some sets where that's like a good first pick that has like massive, let's say, value over replacement. Mm -hmm. And there are some sets where that card is good, but nothing special, right? It doesn't really make your deck a lot better. Maybe it's a round replacement or slightly better, right? And the way I assimilate the information is like every format I start playing, I pay attention, I think about like how many four toughness creatures are there in this format. If there's a lot of small creatures, then Electrify is not going to be that effective. If there's a lot of big creatures, then Electrify is not going to be that effective. If there's tons of, you know, three fours, especially for four and five mana, maybe with abilities, tons of four fours, you know, tons of things that Electrify lines up really well against, then Electrify is going to be way more effective than right. it, than it would be on average, or it might have been when it was in past formats. And, you know, in the other examples where the creatures are mostly five fives and six sixes or mostly two twos, it's going to be less effective. So I try and just take each format in, like, kind of in and of itself and not draw from the past too much. Yeah, which is a, which is a really easy thing to, to fall for that trap. Of. I mean, because it's interesting because it starts to go into sort of the mentality that we all have as, as limited players, which is that we want to lean on our experience and, and on the, you know, on our, on our, past you know to help us prop forward where we're not just starting from square one every time but you need to reel it back in enough so that you're not letting the past actually screw you up right i view the past as an opportunity to kind of train myself so like because i've mm -hmm. played so many limited formats i can like more quickly identify how good electrify is in this format but i don't want to think electrify is roughly as good as it's been on average across all limited formats right i want to use the past as like training as like training experience for getting for sharpening my ability to determine how good electrify is this time okay uh this next question is very uh broad question it comes from brian who says mid-range combat math always confuses me i know brian's not alone in this uh when the board gets messy with creatures i feel like i do not play optimally and this is the interesting part about the way that he he asks this question he says any tricks well, that's one of the hardest things to do in Magic. I mean, when I have a teammate that I consider better than myself on my team, like Luis, that's the kind of spot where I'll often look at him and be like, what do you think is optimal? Uh, I don't know if he has any real tricks or if he just, you know, really understands the boards that well. I mean, there's no tricks here, right? Like Luis, you know, he Ben's saying he would ask you this question in, in like at a team GB or something, but there's no trick to figuring this out, right? You just have to do it. Yeah, I think that one of the things I talked about uh, in one of the earlier shows, I have no clue which one, uh, <laughs> when talking about uh, analyzing combat is you don't get to a combat with – or a, a board state with like four creatures on each side. Im immediately you get there incrementally and you can kind of figure it out then add to it as it goes on. Like you knew what it looked like when it was two on two. Then they add a third and you can see how it changes things but you're not solving the whole thing from nothing. But – Still, it gets more complicated. It gets much, much more complicated with each additional creature because it opens up, you know, six more combination blocks instead of just – instead of adding 50 percent, right? Like, right. you know, two is like twice as many creatures as one, but it can add up to, to more blocks. Three is many more because now you're like double or triple blocking. So I honestly like – the way I always think about it when I'm deciding whether I want to attack is I just like line up what I think their optimal blocks are like with in terms of creating value. Like do they have a three, three that can block my two, two? Do they have a five, five that can block my four, four? Okay. If they don't, do they have a four, four and a two, two that can block my five, five and just go from there and see how much damage they'll take. And you can usually, you can get to it, but you can't spend that time every turn. You kind of have to do it and then just like adjust it as the turns go on because you will get, or you should get called it for playing slow if you will take too long. Whether that actually happens, probably unlikely, but yeah. it, it is, it is hard. I mean, th that's like one of the hardest things about magic. It's actually one of the reasons I think limited is great is you have to be like good at magic to do well at limited. <laughs> right. Whereas I th and, and there's I think, no trick there, right? There's no shortcut. No, like th you this are is going the actual to have work. to learn this stuff, right? Yeah. yeah, no, like I said, I've been playing magic for 23 years and I find that to be extremely hard. And I don't, I don't find a trick. I mean, I do what Luis said. Obviously, I think about um, what the best block for my opponent would be. But uh, I mean, you know, that's hard to do when there's four creatures on each side in so many combinations. And uh, I mean, yeah, you just want to create value. I think... The mistake people often make would be attacking in spots like that too often just to simplify the board and kind of like hope something good happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, yeah, I mean, like Louis said, just identify the best blocks your opponent can make. And if that seems like it's profitable for you, then you should probably be attacking. Yeah. One shortcut or trick that, that I would mention here, it's more of a guideline 
uh, that you should keep in mind, especially if you find yourself entering combat in these situations but not being confident about it, is that you know magic tends to heavily favor the defending player in those type of scenarios. You know, if both players have four creatures and one of them says attack with all of them, uh, generally speaking, the defending player, you know, all things equal, has a huge advantage over the player who's attacking. They get to block how they want. They can double block. Uh, and on top of it, they get to act last when it comes time to make decisions about combat tricks, removal spells, or activated abilities. So do keep in mind that if you find yourself kind of pressing in that direction too often and in, and when the dust settles, things don't look good for you, that's normal. And you should probably, you know, th- there should be a good reason for you to try to initiate a big combat step like that. If you're having a hard time, oftentimes it's correct to just not. Yeah, right. that's, that's it, it, a better way to say what I was trying to say. I think people attack too much, not 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 often enough in those scenarios. Yeah. Okay, this next question comes from Stuart, who says, Hi, Marshall MSV. I'm a big fan of your show, but I'm a terrible limited player. Well, Stuart, you came to the right place. We will help. Uh, he says, I've had some success with Seal, but I think that's probably because the formula to follow is more straightforward. He says, basically, I have no idea what I'm doing in draft. One aspect that I struggle with and cannot find any good information about is knowing when and how to prioritize mana fixing, such as dual lands of any kind, mana rocks, etc. I feel that too, uh, that too early in the draft, I don't know what colors I'll be in yet, and later on in the given pack, all the good mana fixing has already been taken. Should I be p- uh, picking fixing of any kind very early, all the time, please help. Oh, I'll let Luis answer this one. <laughs> well, th- th- this sounds like cube draft to me. This doesn't sound like normal draft because mana rocks and dual lands screaming at cube. And in yeah. cube, I tend to be pretty aggressively taking fixing. In normal draft, I think that, Stuart, you'll get better by just don't take any fixing. Just play two colors, play nine, eight, and just worry about having good cards. Like most of the time, that'll be fine. Yeah, you, that was so, my initial thought too, Luis, was was that Stuart is is thinking a lot about something that doesn't rank very highly on the list of things that I really care about when I'm doing a booster draft, uh, unless, like you said, it's cube or, or, or certain formats. But generally speaking, you know, those type of cards are, are low priority uh, on your average draft deck. Yeah, the reason I jokingly passed that to Luis is because back in the day, he used to like to draft a lot of those type of decks with like a lot of fixing and uh, and ramping and things of that nature. But uh, every format is different, and there are good de- three-color decks, good five-color decks, good ramp decks in various formats. But if you're not sure and you want to play it safe, you really can't go that wrong in very many limited formats by drafting 16 or 17 land, uh, you know, four, at least four, maybe six or seven two-drops, pump spells, some three-drops and four-drops. And in those type of decks, you really don't need fixing. One issue I've seen the pros debate for a long time and not really settle is whether you even play Evolving Wilds, let's say, in a two-color deck. Right. I tend to generally, unless I have a lot of one-mana cards, because you know you have to draw it exactly on turn two or three for it to be a problem. But the point is that it's like so close that clearly it's not valuable whether or not you play it or don't play right. it, whether you draft it or don't draft it. Evolving Wilds is very valuable if you're splashing because it's effectively a try land for that. But in a two-color deck, you basically don't need fixing. It doesn't offer a ton. So if you're drafting norm- most limited formats, you can just safely draft 9-8 or 8-8, eight, eight, two drops, three drops, four drops, pump spells, removal, and you really don't even have to worry about fixing. Next question comes from Soren, who says, Hi, Marshall and Luis. I often find myself playing a game and getting into a tough spot with many options, a situation I could uh, that could be a game decider. He says, for some reason, I often find myself thinking about my options, but then stopping to think. And once I get to the point that I recognize it's a hard decision to make, I usually just end up making a decision. And then afterwards, I wonder if my win chance could have been better. Have you got any advice on how I can remind myself to stop and think for a couple of minutes. Also, this question is especially relevant in paper where I often feel the weight of my opponent waiting on me to move on. And then uh, he also says, thanks for the great show. Uh, he's had some good events, some good results at GP side events as a result. That is awesome. I'm glad to hear it, Soren. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward question, right? Like, when do you make that decision? And also, I'm curious to hear you guys' take on that little tidbit he put in at the end about you kind of feel the person staring at well, you and like how that can affect you. Don't as well. feel that at all. Uh, that's what judges are for. Um, if you feel like you've legitimately maybe taken too long and you're a completely honest player, you can call a judge on yourself if you want and be like, hey, I'm thinking a lot. I don't know when I'm hitting, you know, slow play. Uh, feel free to, you know, prod me to play, you know, if I go too far. Mm-hmm. But 
you should never be like making a play because you feel like your opponent is bored or your opponent is getting, you know, annoyed with you. You know, if your opponent is giving you that look and you're sure that's the case, tell them, hey, call a judge if you think I'm taking too long. You know what I mean? Right. As far oh, man, as I, I, I get a ton of edge out of this, I think, because I. I play very fast, and my opponent always feels like they need to like play faster. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of great. Yeah, you also get bored very yeah, easily. Yeah, <laughs> don't speed up or slow down because of your opponent. You know what I mean? Like speed up or slow down because you're required to finish matches in a reasonable amount of time and make plays in a reasonable amount of time. And by all means, be vigilant about the rules and calling even a judge on yourself or whatever. But don't do anything because your opponent is looking bored or looking upset with you or whatever. You know that's just not how a match of magic works. Not in a competitive level. I mean, if you're playing F and M and you know it's just for fun and whatever, you can talk to your opponent but if you're playing even you know a grand prix a grand prix trial a pptq anything competitive you know your opponent does not have your best interests at heart even if they're an honest player they want you to make a play quicker if it, if it means you have less time to think so that you're less likely to produce the best play you know right now when it comes time for you like Luis tends to play very quick i mean i've seen him go in the tank but it's relatively rare that it happens but when i watch you play ben you tend to play quickly until it's time to not play quickly how how do you is it just a matter of just saying this is a hard spot i'm going to think it through so the answer is actually the answer to the first part of of their question paulo actually just made a little short video on this concept called thinking in batches it's um basically and and luis actually touched on it when he was talking about the board getting more and more complicated and there being more and more creatures in play you can't like learn an entire game of magic that's going on every turn. <laughs> that, you can't think through like everything previous that's happened in the game and everything that's going to happen in the rest of the game. So generally, the reason you see me play and I just make plays, make plays, make plays, and then I think for 30 or 40 seconds, and then I make plays, make plays, make plays, is because you have to think ahead. And you have to think with the information you currently have, you know, if I cast this spell and make this attack, what's going to happen? How's the opponent going to block? Where's that going to leave the board? What are they likely to do on their next turn based on the information I have about their hand and the board? Where will that leave me like on my next turn? You know, at least like like a turn to two turns ahead. So if you're trying to figure out the optimal play on a complicated board, you should think like not only like, you know, what can I attack with? You should think like, okay, what am I going to do post-combat after this attack? Where's that going to leave the board? Does that leave the opponent a great counterattack or something like that? No? Okay. What's going to happen? What are they likely to do on their next turn based on what turn it is in Constructed? Or what's an average? Do they still have creatures in their hand? You know, whatever. And then, like, where will that leave me on my next turn, let's say? And after you think through all of that, I know it sounds like a lot, but after you think through all of that, if you can, like, kind of envision where you're going to be a turn, two turns later, you'll have a good understanding of what you should do right then. That's where, like... You can't necessarily know the right play, but you can figure out a play that will work for you, that will be a good play. Okay. Yeah, that's great stuff, Ben. And and that is, it's just a matter of recognizing when it's time to put that level of thought in versus when it's not. Uh, and, and you'll get better at it. I mean, a lot of the, the decisions that you had to make when you first started playing end up being decisions that you can make very quickly sort of in the background in your head once you start getting much better and you can start using more of that bandwidth towards the really, really tough decisions. Yeah, or you could just be like Luis and know the best play at all times know, and never so have annoying. to think. How do you do that, Luis? <laughs> uh, I don't What's know. What's your secret, lucky, I guess? <laughs> What's your secret? <laughs> if, I could, if I could really find a, a very efficient way and useful way to impart that, I think I would, but I, I really can't explain it except for what I talk about every week on the show, I suppose. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Next uh, question comes from Philip, who says, I tend to do really well early in a format, but I struggle later. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's lagging card uh, reevaluations. Do you experience this? And what do you think I might be able to do about it? He says, I love the show. Thanks for all you do. I I've have the a, answer. Yeah, go for it, <laughs> Luis. This is going to be an answer you'll hear a couple times. We talked about it last Level Up show, too. Uh, I think it's small sample size. That's just the first place I go with anything like this when someone mm -hmm. thinks like, oh, because the other question was like, I win a lot of my game ones and lose post board games, or I win early in the format yep. but struggle later. It's just going to be sample size most of the time. Like, I mean, maybe Philip's playing hundreds of matches. I just don't think that's true. And I think what happens is Philip has this narrative now, and now even even like kind of uh, grows on itself. Where now you notice more when you win early, and you notice more when you lose late. Even though if you added them all up, it's I, I doubt it's I, I bet it's well within just normal variance. Yeah, con confirmation bias can certainly creep in at that point. Uh, you know, one one reasonable way that this could actually be happening, if it is, is like we do the set review. 
right? And if you go in early in a format and you've listened to our set review, you've thought about the card evaluations for yourself, you've looked at the set and kind of figured out some of the pieces that go together and maybe even had a good early start on memorizing the instant speed stuff that actually matters. And you go in and play against the players who generally tend to only come out when the set's new, which is when a flood of new players tend to come out. You're going to have a huge edge on them. I mean, that's a big part of what we do here and why so many people like the the set reviews is just because you just get a big edge on, on your opponent when that's the case. And that edge should, assuming that you don't adapt, it should actually get smaller and smaller as the worst players leave the ecosystem and as the players who weren't as uh, ahead of, on the set as you were, start to catch up to you if you're not trying to stay one step ahead. And that should equalize out. So it's not even a, a, a crazy thing to think that that Philip is just smashing the the worst players and the and the players who aren't as prepared as him, but that the rest of the field is is thinning into the better players and, and that they're also catching up. You touched on what I was going to say, Marshall. Like, I agree with Luis. 90% of the time plus, it's just what Luis said. Yeah. It's just small sample size. I was going to mention how earlier, you know, we were talking about that pro tour where Martin was telling me he wasn't feeling about the draft format because he didn't win a single draft online or whatever. He was yeah. getting crushed, and then he 6 0 the limited there. Right. Ultimately, 20, 20 drafts, 50 drafts, they're just not good sample sizes. You know, that sounds like a lot, and they really just aren't. But you did touch on uh, one thing that I was going to say, which is uh, players leaving the ecosystem. The pre-release... And week one of drafts and week two of drafts and week three of drafts are generally going to be everybody because they're excited about the new set. Mm -hmm. You know, I do a lot of drafting on my local store and, you know, they're packed week one and week two. But week 10, it's just the diehard draft. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> the regulars. So, right. So depending on where you're drafting and who you're drafting with, whether it's actually whether it's in person or on Magic Online, either way, if drafting like week two after a set comes out, there's going to be a lot more casual drafters than there's going to be week 10 after a set comes out. Then you're playing just the people who love draft and draft all the time. And, you know, so that could be a reason. You know, the competition might be just a little bit softer in the early weeks than it is in the later weeks of a format. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So something to keep in mind for, for you, Philip, as you work your way through, make sure you stay up on that, but it's not unexpected. Uh, next one comes from Michael who says, I have a pretty consistent crew I play with each week. Out of the eight people I play with, there's only one other person who consistently challenges me. I was wondering if you two, uh, and three in this case, uh, had input on how I could help my buddies improve to make the games more competitive without coming off as rude. That's very tough. Not something I'm really good at either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you know, ultimately, I know that I got good at Magic uh, in large part because we started going to Grand Prix and trying to do team drafts against the pros and play against the best players we can. I know not everybody has that option, but I mean, even locally, if you can just grab the third and fourth best player and maybe just try and discuss plays, try and uh, discuss anything that's hard and complicated, reason through, be open to criticism, welcome and invite it, you know, spend a lot of time analyzing situations that aren't even particularly important just to develop your understanding of them. Mm -hmm. You've got a shot to improve. Yeah, it is tough because you have to understand what the motivations of the players that you're playing with are. Uh, you know, the times when you see a team or a group of people really improve and, and make big strides are when everybody's on the same page, when everybody is competitive and wants to get better actively, where, you know, there's a wide range of personality types that play magic. And some people just want to do a booster draft every Saturday with their buddies. And then that's it. They don't really think about it for the rest of the week where, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you have people like us three on the show here who will message each other and send pictures and what's the pick. And we'll think about this play we made last Saturday in some random booster draft and really try to figure out what we did. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll spend weeks preparing for TDSL and I'll just open glory bringer. <laughs> <laughs> well, your preparation certainly paid off in that scenario, but yeah. So I think that one thing, Michael, you should do is really try to gauge what it is that those people want, because if they do, if they're not interested in, in, in seriously take, taking it on as improving, you shouldn't, you really shouldn't try to, to change their mind on that. But if you do have some players there that are like, no, I really want to get better. Like that, this is something that's important to me. Those are the people you should focus on. And, you know, you can, you can give them access to resources that you find interesting. If you find a really great article, send it to them. You know, email them a link and say, hey, you might like this. If there's an episode of this podcast that you think could help them, send it to them, you know, and, and this is the type of thing that when you get that seed. But, but if, if you do, make sure to send the Patreon link too. 
God. <laughs> <laughs> always selling, huh? <laughs> always be closing. Yeah, always be closing. But, but Michael, you should just try to pick your spots with that. But I don't think there's any problem with, with facilitating it. Just don't do it to somebody who doesn't want it. You will come off as rude if you do that. And then that's not cool to, to them or for you. Uh, next is Jaeger, who says, uh, when should a player diverge from mainstream set and card analysis like LR set reviews, pick order lists, that kind of stuff, and start developing their own theories about a limited format, holistically, a best color pair, an underrated or underrated uh, or overrated draft, draft archetype, etc. When have you leveled up from the theory uh, follower to theory crafter? And, and I'll start off with this one because one thing that we always say when we do the set reviews on this show is that they're meant to be a starting point. And Luis and I are very, very much of the mentality that we are of the, we want to teach you to fish, not give you a fish type people. Um, you know, we constantly are changing our evaluations and our ideas of the format as it works through. And we do our best to keep you updated on to kind of where we're at as we go. But the best possible thing is for you to take, like, let's say you're relatively new. So you're still having a hard time, like with the baselines on these cards, you can take ours as a reasonable baseline. And I'm confident that ours is that at least, you know, it, given uh, the time frame that we put them out in, but you should always be changing that you should always be questioning it you should always be looking at new information and trying to uh merge those things together on your own because you have experience that we don't i mean you've drafted at your local store and you've noticed things and you know we can't do a show every single day to tell you every detail of what we've done as far as changes and, and ideas for the thing so you should do this all the time jaeger even if you're not that good it's really important that you develop the skill of starting to assimilate the information that you have from other sources into your own worldview for magic. So don't be shy about that. I mean, sure, it might lead you to lose a little bit more early than if you just stuck with the information that was handed to you by people that have been doing this for longer. But in the long term, you're going to be way further ahead if you develop the skill of doing this rather than, okay, well, I got to go look at this pick order list because I just, you know, have never really bothered to understand how these things work. So don't be shy at all, Yeager. You should you should definitely be uh, trying to be at least a mini theory crafter right off the bat. Yeah, and a lot of the same skills that go into card evaluation, I, I think, go into making draft picks or even plays during the game. So mm -hmm. it's a good it's a good muscle to train. Yeah, I don't think those things are at, at odds with each other the way you're describing it, Yeager. To be honest, um, so I view like resources as. Um, as resources, as references, as uh, inspiration. And I'm always trying to think about and learn and understand. So, you know, if I'm doing a draft format, uh, I'm going to try and, you know, do what feels right. And if I'm not having a lot of success with black, let's say, I'll go to my best resources, you know, like if I'm on a playtesting team and I think the next best limited player on my team, let's say, is Martin Yuzo or whatever, I'll go to Martin and I'll be like, hey, Martin, how do you draft black in this format, right? And when he tells me, I'm not, look I'm not taking his answer as, I'm going to do exactly what he says, exactly the way he says it. I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself, okay, let me think about what he said. Let me go do some more drafts. Let me try and uh, value some of the stuff he was valuing and pay attention to that. And then I'm going to like kind of incorporate that and kind of develop my own theories from there. So what I mean is when you see, when you, when you read limited or listen to limited resources or read articles, you know, you take that information, you don't do it exactly as they say it and you don't try and be contrary to it. You take it as a reference, as a resource, and then you go draft. And you try and figure out exactly how good each thing is and exactly, uh, you know, what everything is worth. And you have this, like, you have these resources in your back pocket to help guide and steer you in directions. Okay. Yeah, that's great stuff. And you should keep it up, Jaeger. I think you're on the right track. Uh, next comes from Yuri, who says, not tilting as a level up moment. Uh, you know, like a, a growth moment, uh, since keeping yourself together will increase your long-term win percentage. Okay. That we, we know that we've talked about tilt on the show a lot. And, and Yuri says, I seem to handle things out of my control, like getting mana screwed, mana flooded, or having the opponent just have the nut draw, uh, much better lately. Nice job, Yuri. That's, that's commendable. Uh, however, it seems I have a very hard time not tilting about things within my control, like making obvious mistakes or like a misclick on Magic Online, especially when they cost me the game, the match, and the prize payout. Any tips on how to stop yelling at myself for being so damn stupid or at least stop thinking about that one little thing all the time? He says he loves the show. Ben? I have something here. Uh, yeah, what do you think, Luis? 
Well, I think to some degree it's good to punish yourself there because when you feel it, that's when you don't make those mistakes again. That's when you learn things from from what happened. I ask any you know anyone who's like played on the pro tour a bunch, like they they can like rattle off like points where they made valuable mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that is literally one of the more important things about, you know, being good at magic is being able to not only point to these, but feeling them because you got to feel it to care about it. That said, you kind of got to cut yourself some slack too. And I think that it's, you have to hold both things at once, you know, you you need to care about the mistakes you make and not want to make them and remember them, but you also just can't beat yourself up about them. So it's tricky, but as part of the, what you have to learn is like, take the good from it, which is I'm not going to make this mistake again and leave the bad. I, you know, I actually don't mind losing matches to my mistakes because at least I walk away from the match knowing if I did, did better, I could have won. That's way less frustrating to me than like just getting mana screwed. So it sucks. You think about it more, but at least, you know, there's room for improvement. So take, take it as a good sign when you make mistakes that you, it just means you, you, you can level up. You can, you can not make those mistakes again. And once you make a, a really heinous mistake, you should be able to cross that one off the list for the most part. Well, I'm the same as you. Um, you know, um, my mistakes bother me a lot. Uh, I don't get upset at all about screw and flood. Like, I'm a human, obviously, if I get uh, mana screwed or flooded, like playing for top eight in a good matchup, I'll feel some minor frustration. But I know that's happened to my opponents, too, and it really doesn't bother me long term, long run. Whereas when I punt away a match, an important match, you know, in tournaments that I've prepared for and traveled to and everything, it bothers me. You know, that's the part I can control. Uh, The first thing I would say is magic's really hard. So you have to cut yourself slack. You know, uh, the best players in the world make mistakes every tournament. You know, like maybe not, you know, flashy game losing mistakes but if a mistake is any play that isn't optimal nobody's ever played a tournament optimally right magic's an extremely difficult game uh other than that as far as managing your own tilt in tournament i agree with what louise said in that i think it's valuable for these mistakes to upset you so i think if you can you know take them with you after the tournament and think about them and like feel them and remember them i think that's actually a positive during a tournament it's really hard to measure our own tilt, to know how much our tilt affects our plays. Of course, ultimately, when you make a play in Magic, the only reason you're making it is because you think it's the best play. So even if you're a little bothered by the mistakes you made last round, if you can feel that anger but just kind of shelve it and then just still make what you think is the best play based on the information you have, then maybe, uh, maybe your day won't be as enjoyable, but you won't cost yourself equity, you know? So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I can feel where you're coming from. I'm very similar to you in this. And uh, that's kind of my perspective is, you know, my mistakes bother me. They always bother me. They bother me, uh, you know, weeks after the tournament. But I try not to let them affect my decision making during the tournament, of course. I just, you know, I just have it inside me that, you know, I'm upset that I made this bad play and cost myself all of this that I put hard work into. And then I, when I'm playing my next match, I try and make the best decisions I can at all points, the same as I would if that mistake didn't happen. Yeah, they're going to happen. You, you, so it really is just a matter. I, I, I like what you said, Luis, about that, that it does kind of show that you care, right? Like, I, I think there is something to that. It's just... If it if you tilt so hard that it ends up actually costing you more uh, as a result, that that's the point where you really have to try to rein it in. Uh, but I think it's okay to feel a little. I mean, you should feel some pain, you know, if if you screw up. It's it's part of the experience. Uh, next question comes from Parker, who says, after a 15 year hiatus, uh, I started back up a few weeks ago and have already won a local booster draft thanks to all your great advice on LR. Great job, Parker. Uh, my question. As a newly returning player, I'm a huge fan of Draft and Seal because I don't have a playable standard deck yet. I have a few friends uh, with some prior Magic experience that are interested in returning as well, but it feels like there's an extremely sharp learning curve for them since they're uh, brand new to drafting. Do you have any recommended games? This is for you, by the way, Luis, I think, uh, of us three. um, Or methods to smooth out that learning process to get players up to speed faster. You know, I know that uh, there's a lot of I've heard people call them drafting games or games that where where you're 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 doing something that looks like a booster draft, but maybe they play out differently after. Are are there any that you th- can think of, Luis, that would translate to some of the skills you could use for magic? Uh, so Parker actually mentioned mentioned Sushi Go in a parentheses here, and I, I think Sushi Go is a, is a cute little game that actually does you do just draft. All it is is the draft portion, which mm-hmm. is cool, and that will get you ca- kind of like familiar with the mechanics of drafting and like okay. the basic idea of like picking the best card for your deck uh, and 
I think that's it. Plus, it also takes like 10 minutes to play the game, so it's great. I actually am, am a big fan of the game. Um, so that one's good. You could play like various deck building games. Ascension is like kind of one of the classics at this point. But honestly, once you're getting to that point, I would rather just uh, play sealed deck and then start transitioning into drafting. Maybe draft with one of your friends, like whether online or just sit behind them and help them draft at one point just so uh, they can get more familiar with it. Because once you start getting more complicated, you should just be practicing magic, not other games, because the best way to practice magic is to practice magic. Right. You know, it's interesting because I think that, you know, being a really good booster drafter is very difficult. Like it takes a lot of time and effort. You have to understand a lot of things. (laughs) I I was a very bad booster drafter for most of my pro tour career. So there you go. But one I, I'm not even I'm not even kidding. This isn't false modesty. Ask Ben; he'll tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, it's true. When I, when we first started working together, I would watch these like drafts and picks, and like for example, we talked a little bit earlier about how like splashing and you know fixing isn't something you're trying to do in most formats, right? And Luis would show me his deck like after draft and be like, "You'd splash this, right?" Because I was criticizing him for splashing a lot because it's not something you should be doing that often. Uh-huh. And I'd be like, "Yeah." And then I'd see his deck next time and it'd be three colors, and I'd be like. And he'd be like, look, you'd splash this, right? I have this fixer and I have this good card to splash. I'd be like, yeah. And then I'd start to think about it. And I'm like, well, how is it that like 75% of Luis's decks are three <laughs> colors when it's correct, let's say, 20% of the time, right? So then I started watching him draft and I was like, well, you know, you're taking, you know, this fixer early here over the solid playable fear two color deck and you're taking this other good card in a different color to now splash it because of this fixer. So like that's that was just a, a hole, you know what I mean? That was just bad drafting, you know, like... Sometimes that happens naturally. For example, your first pick is splashable, but then you don't see those colors, and then you have an opportunity to pick up a fixer. The point is, drafting is really hard. Even a great player like Luis, you know, one of the best players in the history of Magic, had this, like, huge leak in his draft game, right? And that's in addition to other leaks, like, you know, not really understanding that cards that cost seven require, you know, (laughs) almost half the lands in your deck in play to cast. (laughs) So, you know, it's a huge flaw because if you miss land drops up to seven, then you could lose the game with this card in your hand and no ability to cast it, right? And To to, to be clear, this was after I had five PT top eights. (laughs) It's true. It is. This isn't like like my third PT and Ben's teaching me how to draft. This is after I just was like... An established good player, and Ben watched me draft for six months and was like, what the hell are you doing? (laughs) And the thing is, you know, once you understand that and you process that properly, it doesn't mean you never use it either. Sometimes it's right to draft a seven drop or two. Sometimes it's right to splash. So, you know, it's really hard to do these things optimally. The advice I would give on this is the same advice I give to everything. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Don't look for absolutes. Don't get set in your ways. Think about everything and then think about it again and just, you know, uh, consult your resources, but don't look for an absolute answer. Just, you know, trust yourself to, if you're practicing, to think and pay attention and try and learn. Okay. So you Ben know, says ben, play Sushi pe- Go. Pe- people would would prefer like maybe a checklist of seven absolute answers that at the end you'll be good at draft. Yeah, that's unfortunately and fortunately, depending on Actually, how you look at it. Ben just showed not me that works. earlier today. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been asking him for years, and he finally unleashed the list on me. It was different than I thought. Really if, interesting. If we yeah. had that, then Magic wouldn't be the best game of all time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's true. It's true. The reason Magic works is because there are things that are right eighty percent of the time, things that are right ninety percent of the time. You know, there are things that are right one hundred percent, and maybe very few, or very, not even really one hundred, but very close to it. But it's very few. Yeah, and, land, land number two is just the right play. <laughs> right, but but like the idea is basically, you know, Magic doesn't really have a lot of absolutes. Uh, it has guidelines. It has things that are right a lot of the time. And if you really want to get great at the game and understand the game and play the ge- play the game well, you should always be thinking and trying to understand like what's going on, so that you can find the play that's right ten percent of the time when it is correct. Right. Let's take a look. Uh, next question comes from Johnny. Says I find myself having a hard time beating many of the guys at my local game store. Most of them have been drafting years before I started, so they're really good. Is there any value? to trying to rotate game stores and playing other people, or should I just keep grinding it out? It's It kind of touches on what you said earlier, Ben, about finding better players. It sounds like John's in a pretty good spot. Well, it depends on what you want, John. I mean, if your goal is to improve your magic skill as much as possible, as quickly as possible, you should just pay a lot of attention to everything those guys are doing. You know, if they're better than you and they're beating you consistently, and you seem to recognize, which is awesome because a lot of people don't, that it's not variance because they're beating you consistently, then you can learn from them. 
So just see the type of cards they're playing, see the type of decks they're drafting, see the way they're playing in game, pay attention to everything. Now, if you want to have fun and win games, but not get better, because then you might want to find easier competition. If, you know, I mean, there's a lot of players that, you know, if they sit against seven players that are just not on their level and are way better than them, they're not going to enjoy the bad records and the losing. So you have to decide what your goals are and what, you know, what you're looking to accomplish. This next one's kind of interesting, uh, and I'm glad I have both of you here because <clears throat> I want to get both of your takes on this. This comes from Matthew. It says, hey, Marshall and Luis, maybe a slightly different sort of level up uh, question aimed more at Luis and, of course, at Ben as well. Uh, how often do professional players generally play? He says, obviously, the run-up to a specific tournament is going to be marked by more focused practice, but is there some variable, variable play threshold that you need to play to stay in shape? I'm interested in trying to bring my game to a higher level, but can never quite find as much time as I'd like to practice. Is, say, a draft or constructed lead every two days uh, a feasible way to eventually build up to high-level play? Or at the top, do you really need to be able to at least initially set aside more time? I've got bad news for Matthew. Uh, once you get to the point where you're very, very good, you don't need to play a ton. You know, look at Paulo Vitor Damarosa. He plays two weeks, four times a year, and he's one of the best players of all time. Uh, you know, Ben goes through periods where he doesn't play for very much and goes through periods where he plays 50 hours a week. I go through periods where I don't play that much. Thing similarity between all of us is we, we all played like 10,000 hours to get to this point. And I'm not saying you necessarily have to spend 10,000 hours literally, but if I bet any any person who's like platinum, any person who's world class played so much to get to the point where then they don't have to play very much that it is a huge upfront cost. Like how many people have qualified for the pro tour who have been playing for less than two years? I bet the answer is very small. Oh, yeah. It's and I think I think it's average like eight years or something, I bet, if not more. And you know, Ben's been playing for 20 years. I've been playing for 20 years. <laughs> Paulo's been playing for 20 years. Like these these things are all they sound ludicrous. And I'm not saying and I don't want to be discouraging in the sense that like I don't think Matthew's goal is to be one of the 10 best players of all time. I mean, that'd be great, but I don't think that's what, like what he's asking. In order to really get to the point you don't need to play a ton, you have to spend a ton of time just internalizing and understanding all of these concepts. There's a lot of things that, you know, we try our best to explain. And that's what, like every week we're trying to like break these things down, but it's hard to remember all of them because we take a lot of it for granted. It's hard to distill some of them because some of them are stuff that you can't really explain very easily. Like when Ben says... Yeah, there's a lot of 90% decisions, 80% decisions, 30% decisions. We play a game of magic and we just automatically do a ton of them without thinking about them. And trying to parse those out is kind of the challenge of making content, which I enjoy. So it really depends on what Matthew's goal is or anyone who's listening to this. You can, depending on your goal, get away with much less time. Like there are people who have been playing for two years and then, you know, win, win an RPTQ. But if you're asking how much do you have to play to be uh, to to basically get by at high level play, the answer is a ton of upfront time and then not as much maintenance as you might think because once you understand magic fundamentally, then you you just need to know all the all the cards and practice an individual format, which I don't know takes two weeks or something along those lines. It doesn't take ton a ton of time. It's just learning the actual like physics of the magic universe that takes so long. There's not really much for me to say. I mean, I agree with exactly what Louis said. Um, and How often uh, do you play, Ben? Well, I mean, the user even uh, asked this, um, the listener. Um, it's like the run-up to a specific tournament, you play a lot to learn your deck, to, to learn your lines and all of that. But I don't play a lot for a specific tournament to develop my understanding of magic. It's to learn my deck and to learn the lines. So it's basically exactly what Louis said. You know, you have to play infinite to get good, to get great. And then once you're good or great, then uh, as the listener even asked, it's it's just uh, playing a lot in the run-up to a specific tournament. You know, if I haven't played Modern in four months, it doesn't mean I don't know how to play Magic anymore, but it means I'm not that familiar with what's going on in Modern right now. So then, as you're witnessing, I hit the Modern Leagues. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> playing in the, in the hotel room here. And uh, certainly one league every two days is not going to get me familiar with Modern in two weeks. That's, that's maybe five, six leagues over a two-week period. I would want to do a lot more than that in terms of preparation for a, a tournament that I was serious about. Probably more like two leagues a day than a league every two days. But it's to 
It's to make the best list to, and get familiar with my list and all the lines of play and get familiar with all the decks people are playing right now and how, you know, lines against them and develop good plans and sideboard plans against them. It's not to get good at magic. To get good at magic, play a million hours, and then once you're already good, it's exactly like the listener said. It's just practicing in the run-up to a specific tournament. Do you ever play I, for fun? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I do, like, you know, random, um, like, battle box or cubes or just eight-man drafts on Magic Online towards the end of a format when there isn't even another, you know, competitive tournament. Because you enjoy it. Yeah, because limited is the best and uh, constructed is stupid. So Can I, uh, can I make an admission here? <laughs> yeah. I After recording with that Manalist Dredge deck, I actually played like another league with Manalist Dredge just for fun, not recording. Oh, and yeah. So you do it. That's, dis- I, I, that's I mean, disgusting. That's not fun. <laughs> that is really bad. <laughs> Don't acknowledge that he said that like it's fun. Nobody plays Manalus Dredge for fun. Nobody with a soul. I literally did. What Nobody a with a monster. Heart. <laughs> Great. He he then fired up the cube and drafted Mono Red too. What, <laughs> what I do for what I do for fun after playing two weeks of modern leagues is go do a bunch of eight man drafts because that's fun. Manalus Dredge is not eight, fun. Eight, eight player drafts. Yeah, Manalus <laughs> Manalus Dredge not fun at all. So I I, I do want to loop back because I, as rereading this question. Um, Basically, if Matthew's looking for a feasible way to build up to high-level play, uh, he even says it, do you, at the top, do you need to initially set aside more time? I would I would start by paying the upfront cost of being more focused, but know that once once you have learned magic, it doesn't take infinite. Like, you can play three leagues with a constructed deck and probably be in decent shape. So, and okay. I also will say that the first 10 matches with a new deck are worth so much to you. Like, I play a ton of Magic. I played a ton of Magic. I still get a ton of value off playing 10 matches with a deck I haven't played before. So even like sometimes we switch decks at the last minute at a Pro Tour. Even then I'll try to get a bunch of games in just the night before with that deck just so I understand the mechanics and all the little things that you would miss by just looking at the deck. So no matter how good you are, the first bit is like really high dividends. So basically I would try to get better at magic fundamentally and then know that y- your each individual practice session is is worth a fair amount. You don't have to go overboard there. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Though I don't agree with Luis that three leagues is reasonable practice for a tournament, I do agree with the important concept that he's highlighting that like there's diminishing returns on the, the gains from more and more and more practice. So nobody should feel like you have to hit a certain number. You know what I mean? It's not like if you play 10 leagues, you're going to do well in your tournaments, but if you play eight, you won't. It's more like what Louis said, make sure you play at least three, you know, if you get a fourth good, if you get a fifth good, but each additional one offers less than the previous one. So just do as much as you can if you, until you feel like you're not learning. Good rule of thumb for me is like, you should know the deck list, be able to write the deck list down without looking at it. And you need to know what every card in your deck and sideboard does without like reading it. And not even like reading it to be because you don't know the card is at all. Like you need to like, you know the difference between intrinsically understanding a card completely and like being fuzzy on it. Like we all understand cryptic command, right? We can just snap off all the modes and it's fine. You 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 might have to read like uh, Liliana Death's Majesty at this point. Sure. So, right. so you, you have to like have absorbed each card. At least that's how I view it. Like I need to be able to pick up my opening hand, look at it and not think about any of the cards at all because I and just think about the matchup because I know what all the cards do in the deck, do in the format, and just do, like, mechanically. Okay. Keep at it, Matthew. Uh, next comes from Johan, who says, Hello, Marshall and LSV and Ben. Uh, come back. Uh, I came back to the game with cons and learned how to draft. He says 40% from listening to the LR backlog and 60% by getting smashed by Sweden's most vicious drafting scene. That seems like a good place to do it. Thanks for many hours of entertainment, value, and magic improvements. You're welcome, Johan. My question is about tricks in limited. I think I have identified a weak point in my game. I regularly find myself in situations where I suspect my opponent might have a combat trick. If I attack or block in a certain way, I will get blown out if they have it. I often shrug in my mind and think, if they have it, they have it. They got to show it instead of uh, me playing scared. What follows is often me getting blown out by uh, said trick. What can I do to improve upon playing around combat tricks? When is it worth it to play around them uh, when double blocking? Thanks again. Obviously a very broad question here from Johan and not one that you can really answer, uh, you know, without seeing each situation. This is a a more of a each individual spot type thing. But I am curious what you guys have to say about this idea of of Johan struggling with 
the process, right, of, of how to evaluate these things, when to play around things and whatnot. <laughs> I, I just don't play around things. It's great. They just never have it. <laughs> so to, to be honest, I'm pretty far on the side of not playing around things either. But uh, basically the process is you have to envision that card the rest of the game. Like, for example, if, if, if you played around the trick this turn and the trick would have no value on all subsequent turns, there's a good chance you should play around the trick. Right. But if the trick is going to do the same thing next turn or the turn after that, that it uh, would have done this turn, then you're gaining almost nothing from playing around it, yeah. right? So, you know, the, the fir- that's the first thing I usually think about. Like, when they make an attack that tells me they have a certain trick in their hand, they might be bluffing. More than likely, they have the trick, right? Mm-hmm. But if the trick is going to... If I play around it now, and then I'm just going to play into it, and it's going to have the same effect a turn later or two turns later, I'm just going to play into it now in case they don't have it, you know? If, uh, if the trick's going to lose a lot of its value over the next turn or two, then I might play around it. But by and large... Uh, like Luis just said, I think that, you know, it's much better to play around too little than too much. Uh, you can't beat everything in Magic, and putting cards in your opponent's hands is a fatal flaw. Um, if you know, you can identify that for them to make this play, they have to have one very specific trick, and you look at your hand and blocks and can make a set of plays that wins the game in a turn or two and ignores that trick or beats that trick. But if you made the most obvious play, you would lose to that trick. Yeah. Then sure, play around it. Okay. You know what I mean? But by and large, if you're not, if you don't feel confident that you're probably going to be able to win this game while playing around that trick, or you don't feel confident that that trick is going to basically lose most of its value by playing around it here, you know, like right now, that it's mm-hmm. going to do the same thing in a turn or two, then don't play around it. If they have it, they have it. Okay. Well, one thing I also wanted to mention here about this question, now I don't want to put words into to Johan's mouth, but one thing that I, I do see among players as they're learning and, and trying to improve at the game is, uh, let's say that their opponent attacks them with a 2-2, and they have a 2-2 on their own, and they think, well, they could have a combat trick. And eventually they say, mm, I'm going to go ahead and block. And then the opponent does have the combat trick. I think a lot of people f- maybe emotionally feel as if that was a blowout on some level when on a card for card basis, it's just a one for one. And yeah, you know, they probably got some good value. They still have their creature on the battlefield. They got to use a trick as a removal spell. It's, it's not that they didn't, you know, win the exchange necessarily, but I do see people. Uh, take that a little harder than maybe, you know, I think that's an acceptable exchange to make where I think a lot of people go, wow, I got blown out. They had the combat. Trick. I mean, sometimes you're going to get blown out. I mean, even if it, mm-hmm. instead of you just cited an example of an acceptable exchange, like a two, two, yeah. even if you pl- had a three, four and the trick gives plus two plus two and it is a blowout. Yeah. Maybe it was right for you to block because that sure. you weren't going to be able to do the things I talked about. You weren't going to be able to win the game while ignoring that plus two plus two, and that plus two plus two is still going to do the same thing or more in previous yeah. turns. Now, you know, maybe you have a bounce spell in hand, no creature to play next turn, so and you have some seven mana card that wins the game. So maybe in that example, you t- you don't block because next turn you pass with your bounce spell up. Yeah. If they don't attack you, that's a good game for you because now you progress towards hitting land drop seven and playing this powerful seven mana card, uh-huh. right? But... Some, even if it feels really bad to get blown out, if you never get blown out, you're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? Like, you should not play magic to avoid that bad feeling. You should not play magic to avoid getting blown out. You should play magic to give yourself the highest chance to win. And a lot of times, that means running into things because you're making the play that's the best in a vacuum. And, you're not, and that time, they had it. And yeah. more often than not, they wouldn't. Luis, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think Ben did cover it pretty well. Okay. Uh, but my, my glib answer actually is true, though. I, I tend not to play around tricks at a very high rate. I found it. I found people tend to go- correct in the opposite direction, and so I, 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 I just often assume my opponent doesn't have it. Yeah, all my friends at home tease me. They call me a calling station, which is a, <laughs> a poker term for somebody who never folds. They're just like, show me, show me, show me. And in Magic, I, I do tend to to be play like that as well. Um, last question comes from Ken Barker, who says. Any recommendations on how to go from playing your cards to having a plan for the turn to having a plan for the whole game? So you've touched on this uh, quite a bit, Ben, during the course of this episode about uh, thinking of things in a big picture, processing all of the elements. Do you have any thoughts on how to actually force yourself to go from just each of these stages? Well, you definitely should force yourself. You should make a concerted effort. It is a very important thing in magic. Now, as far as how to accomplish it, 
just build up slowly, I would say. If you're used to just making one play at a time and only thinking about that one play, you're probably not going to think about the rest of the game or three full turn cycles or whatever all at once. Just try and think about the next decision point after the one you're about to make. You know, the card you're going to play this turn and the attack step. Then start to think about after you get good at that, and, and I'm not saying that like it's a little thing. It may it, there'd be nothing wrong if it took you months before you got good at being able to think about two different things, you know, instead at a time instead of just one. But after you do develop that skill, then think about what the your opponent's attack back is going to look like, or what spells they're likely to cast, and then now you have three. You know what I mean? And just keep building it, you know, because it's very important. And no matter how hard it is, you should be trying to think about magic this way. So just build it up slowly. You know, Luis, you talk all the time about having a plan. You know, if I if I were to sum up your entire LR philosophy in one sentence, it's, it's have a plan. And, you know, Ken kind of outlines that, uh, you know, playing your cards, having a plan for the turn, having a plan for the whole game. Um, making the transition between the two is between those things is hard, right? Uh, between playing your cards and having a plan for the turn. I think that's pretty attainable right that's the kind of thing where somebody just says okay i'm not just going to tap mana and just play stuff i'm actually going to look at what's on the board and figure out what's going on i think that that's a, a one-two step that a lot of people can get but your you know sort of baseline philosophy is really telling people to have a plan for the whole game and that is a bigger step right going from the having a turn to having a plan for the whole game yeah that's one of the biggest steps you can take in magic and i like ben's strategy of just trying to break it down because you can't go from like how do I play my cards to how do I plan a game without intervening steps and learning how to play all your cards is, is a first step. Learning how to play against cards is a second step. Learning that your opponent has a brain and makes decisions also is a step. That a lot of people tend to skip, <laughs> uh, but you, yeah. your opponent also gets information from you And overall limited is much harder than constructed and constructed. You can give me a deck and I can tell you the game plan in every matchup. And that's pretty simple. You can follow that. I mean, it takes, practice to know how to do it mechanically but in limited it's different every single game and you know we, we've had entire episodes dedicated to this the biggest thing is is that figure out how you're going to win the game figure out which cards are important and just play to those things if you ha- hand us you know three two drops and, a, and two pump spells like yeah you're probably going to be aggressive if your hand has a six mana card that'll likely win you the game six mana five five flyer then you're probably going to play to conserve your life total and and so on and so forth so Try to figure out what cards are signposts as to how you should play a game. And there's a lot of different categories like that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the distinctions that I make when I look at the progression that Ken's laid out here is playing your cards is is a generally uh, relatively mindless thing, right? It's, 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 it's maybe the most you get out of it is like being mana efficient, which is important. But uh, then when having to plan for the turn, it tends to have it so that you're looking at what's going on on the board at that moment and looking at what your opponent's doing and what you're doing and trying to figure that out. The One of the big gaps I think that people tend to underrate a little bit when they make the jump to trying to plan the whole game is that it also opens up your breadth of knowledge, not just to the cards in your hand, the cards on the board, and maybe the cards that you perceive out of your opponent's hand, but also the cards in your deck. You know, Ben was just describing a scenario where maybe you have a deck that has uh, a big seven drop in it that, that is unbeatable or that is kind of your main game plan to win the game. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't have that card in your hand yet, yet the plan dictates that you play towards that, you know, where you play to a board state where you're going to have enough time to find it and let it win the game for you. Or maybe you have a couple of cards like that in your deck that are big finishers, you know, taking that leap from looking at the things that you can see with your eyeballs and maybe imagine in your opponent's hand to thinking about the cards that are in your deck that could change things is a big step as well. So make sure that you keep that in mind as well, because when you start doing that and you you really do start to think much more holistically about how a game plays out when you start to think about the other cards that are in your deck. And and I don't just mean specifics either. I do mean game plan wise. You say, I have a ton of two drops or I have a lot of ways to push in damage or I've got a, you know, a fling or, you know, some, some type of effect that will break this board open. Uh, you know, you want to be considering those as well. And I think that that's a big, when you start doing that is when you've kind of really started to tread into the, the whole game territory. All right. That is going to do it for our Q and a with the level up show. First things first, I want to thank our sponsor channel fireball 
cfbcfb.com. Thank you so much for your support, CFB. We love you. And uh, we do recommend that you go there and check them out. Uh, you can get anything you need magic related. And of course, I mentioned it, awesome free content every single day over there. Uh, also, I want to thank our special guest host, Ben Stark. Ben, uh, A, thanks for coming on. We always appreciate it. And B, where can people find you? Well, thanks for having me. I love being on. Uh, and uh, all my content is on channelfireball.com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm BenSA528. Um, so yeah, those are the places you can find me. All right. Thanks for having you. Thanks for coming on again so quickly as well, Ben. And we're actually going to be looking to have you on even, even more often. I like the sound of this. Um, <clears throat> if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find us very easily on Twitter and everything else. If you want to find links to everything that we do, lrcast.com right on the front page has all of this stuff for, for streaming and YouTube channels and all that kind of stuff right there on the front page. So if you want, you can go check that out again, the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources to find out any information about supporting the show directly and getting some pretty cool free perks on top of it as well. That is going to do it for the show this week. We'll see you next time. Okay, Luis, I told you that I was going to take care of the sign off this week, right? Oh, that you did. But I think you had a, a little help. I, I did have a, a, a little helper. So I met a listener of the show at the GP in Las Vegas named Dana. Dana, uh, the first exposure I had to Dana was her playing in the feature match area of uh, the GP. This was the modern G play, GP. She's, well, I'll just let her introduce herself. Dana, six, San Diego. Okay, Louise, so that's Dana, and uh, she, she listens to the show every week. In fact, she even told me that she had a dream that she was watching the show on YouTube and that you reached through the screen and pulled her in to the, to the show. <laughs> Did you do that? Or? <laughs> uh, not as far as I know. Okay, well, she, that, that's what she said. Now, here's the thing, Louise. Brace yourself. I told her sh she could ask you any three questions she wants, I told her any embarrassing questions, hard-hitting, journalistic stuff. She gets to ask you anything. So here's the first question from Dana. What's your favorite animal? <laughs> My favorite animal is definitely the dog. I, I love dog. I, I, that's what I was about to do. Sorry, sorry. I, it just cut out. Yeah, yeah. So dogs are my favorite animal because dogs are just the best. You, you know, there it is the transitive property of dogs that all dogs are the best dog. And except for like the, the little yappy ones, the, the, they are not the best. Wait, dog. Wait, those are my favorite kind of dogs. What are you talking no, about? No, they're heinous. Uh, so yeah, I, I love dogs. So I hope that satisfies Dina's uh, curiosity on that front. Okay, let's get, let's let's get question number two from Dina. What were you doing when you were six years old? <laughs> wow, Dana's making me feel bad about myself. Uh, when I was six years old, she's winning feature matches at a GP, by the way. So, what were you yeah. doing when I was six years old? I was probably drawing pictures of pirates. Actually, if you if you look at my uh, my Twitter feed, <laughs> I actually posted a, a book of pirates that I drew. They're they're Ixalan spoilers. <laughs> yeah, that's what that was. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you were drawing pictures of pirates, and Dana was winning feature matches. Hmm, interesting. All right, last question from Dana. Do you think you can beat me in an elf mirror match? <laughs> Do I think I can beat Dana in an elf mirror match? <laughs> yeah, that's what she said. Now, I want to warn yeah. you, Louise, she was playing elves at the modern GP and she went 5 4 and won her feature. So just keep that in mind. So after taking that into consideration, uh, the answer is yes, Dana, I could beat you in the elf mirror match. I'm one of the best players of all time. Wow, Luis with the windmill She's slam. so cocky. It's unreal. <laughs> I, I literally won a pro tour playing elves. <laughs> I did tell her that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but I will say, I would love to play against Dana in, a, in an elf mirror match. And, uh, All right. you know, just to see what would happen. All right, well, we'll have to get that set up. Thank you so much, Dana, for taking the time to answer our questions. It was really nice to meet you. <laughs>